You are listening to the Southwestern American Choral Directors Association Connections podcast, where we will interview choral directors, leaders, and movers and shakers within our region. I'm your host, Dr. Jeff Wall. We hope you enjoy these conversations. Please like and subscribe this YouTube channel for future content. Hey, what's up, everybody out there in Swack the Land? Uh, Jeff Wall here again, bringing you another episode. This is Andy Wagner today. Uh, he is the Artistic Director of the St. Louis County Community Chorus and was appointed to that position in 2016. That chorus has an active membership of about 200 singers from all over the St. Louis area. In addition, he serves as the Director of Worship Arts at Webster Hills United Methodist Church in St. Louis. He is our r and Chair for Community Choirs. We dive deep in this episode uh, with some kind of a mini therapy session between the both of us, so I, th I think you're going to really enjoy that back and forth. Uh, as always, more about Andy in the description of this video. Um, don't neglect that. Go down there, take a look, and uh, we hope to see you soon in Dallas at National Conference. Hi, everybody. I'm here with Andy Wagner to uh, bring another interview to you and um, hopefully get to know him a little better. So, Andy, tell us a little bit about your backstory, your musical upbringing, and uh, yeah. where you come from. Hey, Jeff. Thanks for doing this. I'm, I've enjoyed so much getting to know our other colleagues. It's a, it's a different level being uh, on SWACTA as opposed to state because we kind of all know each other. Um, and so serving at this next level, I didn't know so many of the people. So these have been really helpful in getting to know people. So, um, you know, I won't bore you with my whole backstory, but I grew up in a pretty musical home. My dad played music and played guitar and um, always had bands. And um, so I, I grew up at an early age playing my keyboard in the garage with my dad, you know, playing music. And so that's a, a big, strong part of my upbringing. My dad actually still performs with me sometimes um, when I'm doing some solo shows, which is super cool. Um, so I kind of started then. Of course, I started piano when I was five or six and took piano my whole life and took voice my whole life and all that kind of stuff. Um, and as far as like my education and things, I, I have to say, I always, anytime I have an opportunity to say this, I did my first um, college stint at a community college and um, I love community college. I think um, community colleges are doing some of the best work out there. I think that there's so many people who have access to music and to choral conducting and to be in this world that wouldn't have it in if they weren't able to benefit from community college. And so some of the best and favorite conductors that I know teach at community colleges. And uh, so I have a, a big heart for my uh, experience there and uh, still I'm in touch with my uh, college professor and that sort of thing. But um, so, yeah, and then I just sort of um, shifted gears. I taught for a couple of years. I really never wanted to teach. Um, I, I really wanted to do church work and community work. And uh, but I had an opportunity to teach at a, a new school in St. Louis. And I did that for a few years and uh, then went to full time church music in 2024. So for 20 years now, I've been doing full time church and um, about 25 years total. But um, that's kind of where I kind of where I came from and how I got here. That's great. Yeah, that's uh, and I echo your sentiments. I, I taught at the community college level for for a while too. So, um, yeah, completely agree there on the on the community college front. Um, okay, so then go into about your role with SWACTA. What uh, what are you going to be doing for us, and and what's your position? Yeah, so I am the community choir R and R and R chair, and um, I am really looking forward to Albuquerque for a variety of reasons. I've never been. Um, I'm so excited that I think I might go ahead of time just to like get a lay of the land because uh, I think it's going to be such a unique conference. And I know Jonathan has some great things in store for us. Um, and having been to virtually every SWACTA conference since 2004, I guess, um, I really kind of know what what to expect and what's expected of me. Um, I I can't say this enough. It's sort of about my love for community college. I would not be where I am today. I would not uh, have the skills that I have, the the friends and the colleagues, the connections that I have, if it wasn't for ACDA and SWACTA and for MCDA. And uh, they have been, they have made such a profound impact on my life. And so I, I don't see it as a burden to serve. I see it as a way to pay back for all the wonderful things that I've gotten out of the people who've come before me in these roles. Um, so I can look back. I'm one of those dorks who saves every program from every conference, you know? And so I can go back and, uh, see what, you know, some things that I really enjoyed. Um, but more than anything, I wanna to try to find a space for connection. Um, I have made lifelong friends and connections and mentors through these conferences. Um, and it's amazing what a happy hour or a, a quick dinner or anything will do 
um, to just make that connection. And so I'm a connective person by nature anyway. And so I always like to, I'm always saying, Hey, do you know this person? Hey, do you know this person? I'm always trying to, you know, put people together. And so I hope in addition to the wonderful clinics that we do and the clinicians that we'll have and the performances and things like that, I hope we build in enough opportunity um, for community, you know, to try to do some things to get to know each other. Um, SWACTA is big because there's so many states, but it's so small when you think about how many people actually conduct community choirs in those states. And so um, it's not that daunting. And so I plan on reaching out to all the state level community choir people. We have a great one here in Missouri, Kenny K. Back, and um, I'll reach out to all the other ones long before the uh, conference and get their ideas and see what they could use and, you know, hopefully build a program around their needs too. Yeah, and I think you hit on one of the missions there that's uh, that, that's on Jonathan Owen's mind and uh, part of the the conference. Yes, it's titled New Horizons, but you know if you look at the title of this podcast, it's the Connections Podcast. If you look at his that uh, biweekly magazine, it's the Connections you know mm -hmm. magazine. It's who he, he is. It, yeah, mean... he's interested in making those connections, and um, that's uh, that's that's really cool. And that's what I get out of these conferences too. Uh, the biggest takeaway always for me is is you know just the one on one sitting down with people. Mm -hmm. you know in passing going from session to session or or even you know grabbing a coffee or grabbing a meal and right. you know swapping ideas so yeah that's really cool that that uh that you, you kind of foster that that same kind of engagement and jonathan as the connector he he chose me he was president of mcda when i first served mcda like 10 or 11 years ago um and so i i, I feel like i have all this connection kind of you know because of him and him uh, taking a chance on me back, you know, when I was a whippersnapper. So I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for Jonathan for that. For sure. Okay. So let's dig into uh, music that, yeah. uh, that you, that you love here. So what do you, what do you think is the best piece of music that embodied your personality you or, know, or otherwise? Yeah. So, you know, the, this is a question that you sent in advance and so I had to think about it. And I, I think just to be a little bit of humor. I feel like Gwyneth Walker's How Can I Keep From Singing? I love that text. And I think that that's, you know, kind of what we do. But it also gets like frantic and hurried and like crazy and rushing. I feel like that's part of my life as well. And so, you know, there's this beautiful melodic part of life. And then there's this part that just starts getting out of control, you know, with all these la la's. And um, so I feel like that piece sort of embodies uh, what I do. I've long loved that text. I think I have every version in our libraries. Um, I in fact, we're doing Marilyn Lightfoot's on Sunday at church, um, but I just love that text. And so I think if there's any piece that sort of um, speaks to me, it's that that text, but also the frantic craziness in the middle of it. <laughs> well, I think um, that, ring, that rings true for a lot of us. Yeah. And another one that, that kind of ties into the connections I have always loved. I mean, don't we have a special connection with those pieces that we did in middle school and high school. I don't know about you, but like I have a strong connection to pieces um, that I used to sing. And so like, you know, Fouch's Consecrate the Place in Day. I did that with the chamber choir not long ago. And that was such a fun piece for me because I, I just sort of brought up with it. But another piece that I love that I think speaks volumes to what I try to do in church and community choir is um, The Claws of Heaven. I, I just love that piece because it has taught me um, and I, I did an article about this once. It's taught me that when I'm around a table and we're making decisions, which is most of my life, let's be honest, there's meetings around tables. And um, when I'm around tables, I, I, I want to listen a little bit more intently. And so when people are sharing their ideas, sometimes it might be their dreams. You know, it might be something bigger than just a spouting off. If I ask somebody a question, and they answer it, they might have thought about that question for a long time. And they might be sharing something really important. And it's so easy for us to sort of brush that off. And so I always think about the text of Claws of Heavens, like, be careful, you know, you're treading on my dreams. This is my, this is my thing. And I think that's important to me because so many people afford me that opportunity when I share ideas. Um, they hear me out, they listen to me, they hear the why. Um, and so I, that text is always important. Um, some people, all they have to give is their thoughts and their ideas and their dreams. And so I always want to take a little extra time to to listen to that. As cheesy as that may sound. <laughs> no, I love it. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, just on that one question, you've given us uh, three repertoire choices. So yeah. <laughs> uh, you, it's it's pretty clear you're, you're a great person to go to for repertoire and resources. Um, I do love I do love rep. I do spend a lot of time in rep. So, yeah, that's great. OK, so moving on into your Desert Island Coral piece then. 
what's one that you would want to have with you for a while and to on loop until you get saved? Um, I, I would have to say, and this is sort of selfish, but I, Mark Hayes wrote a piece for me and my choir, uh, about five years ago, an arrangement of deep river. Um, and I adore it. I love it. It's one of my favorite things to conduct. Um, it just reminds me of such a wonderful time of, um, we, Kevin Macbeth and I did a whole work of, uh, Mark's Hayes at, at Mark Hayes's music at Carnegie Hall with Mark there. And we premiered this piece in New York. And so that piece, I've had a lot of commissions over 20 years, uh, but that piece really sort of speaks to me. And, um, I love, I've always loved obviously spiritual texts. Um, but I think that's probably my desert Island piece. I'd probably pack that away first. That's great. Yeah. You're hitting on this, uh, this idea of you know, pieces that hold special uh, connection to our own experiences. Mm. And I, I think that's a, a great one for you. Um, we all have our own individual ones, but yeah, uh, yeah, I love that. Okay. Um, do you have then a particular philosophy of programming since we're talking about rep here? Yeah. And you know, the, I, I'm going to, I'm going to be honest with you. Okay. I'm going to break it down. Uh, when it comes to programming, um, it's a little different for church and for the, the community course. For church, programming is is primarily you know tied around the sermon series, the lectionary, what what we're doing in the worship, the holy days, whatever's happening. Um, so programming is a little bit more dictated for that. Um, it's also not dependent on ticket sales or anything, you know. And so it's a I can be a little bit more free in in church planning. Um, always have to tie in the ability of the singers and and that sort of thing. Um, but for the chorus, it's a little bit more involved. I think it's a little bit more complicated. Um, I literally, when I'm planning a chorus concert, I, I sort of come up with a theme, a loose theme. I, I find myself nine times out of 10 coming up with a theme, looking for rep, finding the rep, changing the theme. That's kind of like what I, I kind of going down this rabbit hole. Um, for me, I have to think about audience development. Um, we sell tickets. That is we have thousands of people coming to our concerts every season. And so I have to put a program together that our audience wants to see. Um, and so I've been at the chorus next year, I'll be 10 years with the St. Louis County Community Chorus. Um, and we, we, we have to look at that sort of audience development. We are a big machine. And so we have to make sure that people are coming to our concerts to support us. Um, I would say also just cut sort of the breadth of the breadth of programs because of like for holiday concerts, I have to try to um, check all the boxes without it sounding like I'm checking all the boxes. Right. And so I try to find some rep. Um, I try to contact other people. I just actually earlier this morning was messaging somebody on Facebook who's the music director um, at the synagogue that he goes to. And I was asking like, Hey, how do I help, help me out? How can I do a piece that honors Hanukkah that honors, honors Jewish tradition without it just feeling like I typed in, you know, Hanukkah piece and J.W. Pepper. Um, and he was so helpful. And he was, and a little later, we'll talk about that too, but um, there's so many people out there who are ready and eager and willing and honored that you would ask them to help. And so I always get help with rep choices. Um, logistically, I have to do a mix of things that are in our library and things that are new. Um, financially with, we have over 200 singers in our community choir. And so um, it costs six, $700 to do one piece, not counting the instrumentation that we have to buy to do that. And so um, I, it's important for us to um, spend money on supporting new works. Um, we will never not do at least half of our concert uh, of new pieces. I think it's important for us to um, support lyricists and arrangers and composers. And um, that's always been important to us, which is why, you know, we do commissions as well. But I have to think of the the monetary as well, because we have to do, um, we spend, I'm, I'm probably out of turn here, but I, I mean, I, I think we spend over $10,000 $10, a year just in music for two concerts. And so it's, a, it's an important decision financially too. Um, programming, I have to think, um, about our performance space, you know, is it, are we at a big church? Are we at a hall where for the first time next spring, we're going to be singing in this massive gymnasium sort of recreation complex. And I have to plan a, you know, sort of appropriately for that. Um, we have a chamber choir in the community chorus. It's, um, actually our section leaders. It's four on each voice part. And so, um, with the chorus, our size, 
having an alto section leader for 82 altos is not okay, you know, not, not effective. And so our chamber choir acts as our section leaders. And so um, it's a way to sort of reward isn't the right word, but a way to keep our, our really uh, great singers engaged um, and do more challenging music, uh, but they also serve as section leaders. So I have to balance our concerts, the rep and programming with planning for the big chorus and planning for the chamber choir as well. Um, the chamber choir has to have music that sounds like I have to justify having a chamber choir and their music has to be much more difficult. Um, but they also have to learn it. You know, we have to have time to learn it and everything. So I have to think about that. Um, and then I really, uh, finally, and most importantly, I think I bring in some of my worship planning juju to concerts. I think about where will the audience be after a song emotionally? You know, where uh, where's their heart? Where's their brain? How, how are they thinking? How are they feeling? Um, because the the best programmers you know, you want to get them to a place and then you want to take them to another place and then take them to another place. And we've all sat through concerts where we get here and then we start over and we get here and people have a hard time breaking that threshold because they just keep starting over. They, there's no momentum to it. And so I put a lot of thought into transitions. And so how a song ends and how a song begins um, is important to me. And so I, I do spend a lot of time thinking about the connection between the two. Uh, can I carry a theme over multiple songs? Can I carry a, a key over multiple songs? Can we end a piece and then start, you know, it, all the things that, that you all know. But, and then finally just changing like the sonic landscape. It, the, are we having two pieces in a row that has just piano? You know, we have 25 piece orchestra for this holiday concert and that is not a good use of our money if we're doing an acapella piece and then a piano piece and a piano piece. So I try to, I got to put all that into, into context as well. Um, and then really with adults and aging singers, stamina is important. And so I program based on, um, now let me say this, there's also two different ways to, that I think of programming. Programming in the sense of what music am I going to do and then what order of music I'm going to do. So I think those, those are together, but they're kind of separate. But from an order of things that I'm going to do, I have to think about my adult singers and um, you know, if we're doing this massive piece, we, you know, we're opening with the Rudder Gloria this for this concert. And so I know they're going to need a break after song two or three, you know, so I chose a, an orchestra piece or something like that. But most importantly for me for programming is a through line. Um, and then at the end of the concert, I hope that I've sort of kind of continued to take them on this uh, on this place. Not a lot of unnecessary talking. They're not there to hear me talk or pontificate about certain things. They're there for the music. They bought a ticket to hear music and not a podcast from me, <laughs> you know, so I try to keep it, uh, try to keep it moving pretty, pretty quick. That's a lot, but that's how much I put into programming. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, th that's all really awesome because I just wrote down a whole bunch of things that um, I, I also share with all of my conducting students as we go through, but uh, just as sort of backup, <laughs> I'm going to send them to this, this episode so that they can hear you say it as well. And not, not just me. So I wrote down a lot of things yeah. like audience focus and cultivation, uh, the practical aspects of budget, which I don't, don't think a lot of people talk about uh, the season, the venue, the commissions and new music, different mm -hmm. groups that you're programming for the emotional heart of programming uh, it has to go somewhere. Key relationship, sonic landscape, the instrumentation, stamina of your singers and through line of where did you take them on that journey? So hopefully that uh, that bullet point kind of summarizes a little bit about, about what you were you were talking about there. That's yeah, that's, that's awesome. It's also important for us to do music that embodies our beliefs. You know, we're very inclusive, both at the church and at the community choir. And so people pay attention to that. You know, we we don't sing at venues that don't share our beliefs. You know, we don't do music from people that don't share our beliefs and our inclusivity. And so I think I not only want to to have that in my mind, I want to bring those to the forefront, especially at church. And so we uh, with our inclusivity at church, I try my best to program people who share our identity, who share our thoughts. Yeah, that's an important point as well. Uh, OK, so you can take this next question at, at any point of your preparation, but how, how would you describe what a typical rehearsal might look like under your direction? Um, I think they're fun. I, you know, you can ask my singers and I think they think it's fun too, but I think a sense of humor is crucial. I think it's vital, especially for adults. They don't have to be there. They're not getting credit for it. 
They can change any time. They can leave it week three, week seven, week 17. Our success is because of them. And so I, I try to pour a lot into them. And there's some mental health that I want to, you know, that we can talk about later about how I've had to learn to separate some of that. Um, but I try to make it fun. I've sat through way too many boring rehearsals or rehearsals that I felt chastised or, you know, left feeling like, why am I even here? Um, but we have to engage our singers and they won't come back. They have to feel connected. They have to have a reason to invite people to, you know, sell tickets, right. To bring people to the concerts, to invite people. Um, section leaders are vital to this success. And so with the group, our size, I cannot hear everything. And so I have a unique, um, I have a unique thing that we do. Uh, no one can talk in my rehearsal except section leaders. Um, so that not only keeps our rehearsals moving quickly for having 200 singers, uh, but it also empowers the section leaders to, um, they'll get questions and they can answer them. They all get my scores, PDFs of my scores that they can mark their music prior to rehearsal starting. And we often have rehearsals to go over some things. And um, so I, I put a lot of trust and faith during my rehearsals in my section leaders. Um, our, we rehearse in a church, you know, like with two pews and uh, I mean, it goes back 26 rows. It's just, it's crazy. So section leaders are, are super important to that. Finally, um, you know, I try to tell stories. I try to tell jokes. I try to tell stories about my musical past to, to, to make a connection with the song. Um, I don't think in my community chorus, I think I, everybody knows why I chose the song. I will always tell the story of why I chose the song. I'll never choose a song just because it's in our library and we needed one more piece that was in E minor that had a flute part. You know, like that's not what I do. Um, but I also think it's so important um, to make people feel valued in a chorus my size, because our size, because you can slip right in the back door and slip right out the back door and think that your voice, you have 81 other altos. You don't need me. Um, and so I try really hard to walk, you know, the middle aisle and walk all the way to the back. Everybody can see me. And I sort of move all around the space and tell them every rehearsal multiple times how much we value them and the gift that they're giving to their community. And so I just don't think you can do that enough. I think that's more important than the if you do that, the musicality will come. Um, if you just do the musicality, the community won't come. And so you, you kind of get a twofer with the other by building community. So I hope I have a fun rehearsal. It's yeah, fast, yeah. though. I will tell you, it's it's like breakneck because we don't have a lot of time. We don't have a lot of time. I see them once a week for what what ends up being an hour and a half after break and rehearsal and, and notes and everything. I mean, I see them. We have 14 rehearsals to put together an entire orchestral concert. And so it's got to be it's kind of breakneck. Yeah. And, and I appreciate that you um, you shared with us a little bit about the uh, practical aspects of, you know, your section leaders being the only ones that, that can, you know, speak up during rehearsal and just with a, a group that size, that makes complete sense, kind of an orchestral model almost. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you also hit on the the aspects, we call them soft skills, and I don't think that that's the right term for them. But we're talking about, you know, sense of humor and, and uh, you know, feeling connection and, you know, yep. um, reason to be there and all those things. Um, you know, I, those are some of the most important things for our ensembles, I feel like. Uh, because if they don't want to be there to do the notes and rhythms and the, mm -hmm. the dynamics and the musical, you know, phrasing and all that stuff, um, I, I guess my point is that they don't, they have to come for that reason first. Mm -hmm. If they don't, uh, if they don't have that reason in place, then they're not going to get to all the other musical things. So, yeah. And I, it took me a long time, Jeff. I mean, we're talking maybe this morning. <laughs> it took me a long time to realize that I don't need them to like me. I need them to like what I'm doing. Um, that's so hard. I want to be loved. You know, I want, I want everybody to love yeah, me. Yeah. John Wayne all... says, you know, walking around is like running for mayor of nothing. You know, and I feel that sometimes that I'm just sort of, I need everybody to love me all the time. Uh, and that I, I turned a corner when I stopped that. I also don't have the emotional capacity to be that close to that many people. And so yeah. 
that has been a game changer for me in rehearsals. Um, I don't make myself available really. You know, I, I sort of, I'm in a room, I come out and do rehearsal and I kind of go back in the room and let people do their thing. I know that sounds kind of cold, but I try to lay it all out on the table during rehearsal. So, but we do do a lot of social things. We do picnics and outings and all that kind of stuff. So I, I hope that that kind of makes up for it. Uh, opportunities. Yeah, for yeah, that's great. And you were talking about men mental health and that's, I was, and that was my next question is, were you referring to the mental health of your singers or yourself? And, was, you know, it sounds like both, but. Uh, both really. Um, I mean, I, it's hard for me. I have an inherent empath sort of life. And so working at a church full time, um, I just never know. I mean, somebody just walked by my office door that I think was looking for me and you just never know what a conversation is going to bring here. You know, you can meet with somebody who gives you a $10,000 check for a new piano and you can meet with the next person who says, you know, I'm going on hospice. I've got two months to live. And so, you know, any day can give you that, that sort of different things that are happening. And so multiply that by 200 people. I was just, I was exhausted. I was, I was just worried about everything. I was worried about everybody and everything. And um, I passed some of that on to the section leaders. So, you know, people can tell them what's going on in their life. And if they're missing rehearsal, we have a membership person. And so all that sort of gets filtered back to me by the appropriate people. But I just learned that I just, I, I, I have to stop wanting everybody to include me and love me and, um, you know, Re requiring my care because I just I can't care for that many people you know I, I care for them on a on a you know 10,000 foot level I love them and I, I love singing with them and I love making music with them but um, I only have so much emotional capacity to be able to share and that was truly a game changer in my like mental health to yeah yeah we can't be all things forward. to all people yeah and and you know protecting our peace is 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 vital um, yeah. if we want to keep doing this so I think you uh, have a good delegation set up uh, process of delegation, be able to, to bring you those things and protect your peace. So that sounds yeah. great. Yep. Okay. So what, uh, what pointers might you have for an emerging choral leader then? Uh, what I just said, number one, all of those, yeah, all <laughs> protect of those your, protect your emotional investment. Um, you know, I, this, this is, this is an old man. Like I'm going to sound like an old man. Okay. But like social media is, the best and worst thing. Um, Hard agree. Hard agree on that. Yeah. And, you know, no one posts a crappy rehearsal. You know, no one posts the piece that bombed on the concert, but we all have them. And so, you know, what's the, the Roosevelt quote? Uh, Comparison is the thief of joy, right? And that's another thing that I spent so much of my life doing. I spent so much of my life like, oh, look what they get to do. Look what they get to do. And uh, it's just, it's, horrible for your psyche it's horrible for your creativity for your spirit and so you know do your thing every context is different um every budget is different every facility is different every accompanist is different every you know th there's so many factors um that have to go into your own decisions about what you're capable of doing what your students are capable of doing i worked with a one of the things that's great about being a full-time church musician is that I have some time during the day to go work with choirs, uh, high school and middle school choirs. And um, I love that. That's one of my favorite things to do. And um, I was talking to this one teacher and she was just, I mean, she was on a scale from one to 10, she was at a 14.5. And I, I was talking to her about it. It was the beginning of school year. She's like, yeah, we've got this uh, this fall concert we have to do in four weeks or five weeks. And then we sing for this veterans day thing. And then we have this annual madrigal dinner thing or this medieval dinner thing. And then we have our winter concert after that. And I'm like, Whoa, like that is physically impossible. Like you can't do that. You know, you know, you, you just can't do that. And she cried, you know, she was crying and, uh, you know, and this is a person who's out of state. So I feel like I can, I can say this without, you know, claiming who it is, but um, she, we then talked later and she's like, I, I'm not required to do this. I'm just trying to prove myself. I'm trying to prove myself. I'm trying to say that I'm a team player. I'm trying to, you know, these parents think we still need to do the magical thing. These parents have been the veterans thing forever. And I just can't say no to anybody. And I'm like, honey, <laughs> you gotta, you gotta, you gotta say no every now and then for your own sanity, for your student sanity. Um, cause it is impossible to put out quality work. Um, if you're just pumping something out every four weeks which is what she was doing was every four weeks. She had something to do. Um, and I, I get that pressure because at church, I have to pump something out every week. You know, we have to do things every week, but um, just live in your context.
do protect your mental health. Say no if something's not um, feasible, if it's something that you feel like you can't do well, um, because nobody wins if it's a bad performance. You're, you're doing the opposite of what you're hoping to do. They will respect you for saying no, move on, than if you did something that looks like you didn't give it your all because it's showing that you didn't care about it. Um, so that's something I would say. Um, also, I would say um, I love MCDA. I, I think Missouri Choral Directors is just the best. Um, when I first came on the scene in 2000, 2000 was my first MCDA. And um, I have to remind myself that I was coming into this in the middle of people's stories. Like, and I see all these people that had all these things and I wanted it and I wanted to be like them and all that, but I didn't see them when they were 22, when they were 24, when they were 30, even when they were at their first school, now they're at their fourth school or, you know, something like that. And so to the young people out there, I would say, you know, you're catching people at every stage of their life. Um, and you just don't know what it took for them to get there. Um, and so I, I think, um, Reminding yourself that uh, you haven't seen the whole movie, you know, you don't know what what these people have gone through. Um, and so know that you'll get there eventually. Um, if they are a, a good conductor, they're going to help you get there. Right. Um, MCDA puts a lot of thought into new teachers and to students. I, I'm really proud of how many students we had uh, that we have come to our conferences every year. Um, but um, the other thing I would say is ask for help. I know that's cliche, but it not only will help you, but the people are, are so honored that you ask. And I know that because there's people in my life who are skilled choral directors and just for whatever reason, they're not on people's radar to ask for help, right? So there's so many of us that just often get asked. And I think they tell their friend and then, you know, they tell their friend or you do an honor choir, or, you know, you do something like that and you're in the mix, but there's so many wonderful conductors. And I know it's important because people have told me like, why doesn't anybody ask me to come help? And it really kind of hurts their feelings a little bit. Now, some of them don't need to be asked. It's neither here nor there. Right. So let's put that aside. That's another episode, but there are so many other people who would be overjoyed to help you. It would be an honor for them to help you. So it's a, it's kind of a two-way thing there. And so don't hesitate reaching out to people. Um, and I think people, if they can't do it, they'll tell you no, you know, they'll, they'll be honest about it. But, um, and then finally, I would say for our young people, um, kind of the same, same lines, have people come in and visit your rehearsals, um, not only to work with your, your students or your adults, but also to observe you. Um, one of the hardest things, Jeff, that I ever did um, I sang in St. Louis Symphony Chorus from like 1998 till 2002 or something like that. And I remained friends with Amy Kaiser for quite a while. And in 2010, I was conducting um, another community choir, um, the Collinsville Chorale. It's in Illinois. I was there for 17 seasons. And um, I decided that I was going to to start studying conducting again. I had a big concert coming up. I was It was my making my Carnegie Hall debut in 2011. And I wanted Amy to help me sort of prepare for it. So I invited her to come to a few rehearsals and I paid, you know, I, she was coaching me. So I paid her. And, um, well, you talk about a humbling experience. Um, having somebody come to work with your people is one thing, but having come and sit, someone come and sit in the back of the room and watch you is a, is next level, you know? And I was mad for a while. I was like, shut up. But then I, you know, I still do those things to this day that she suggested I do. And it's been an absolute game changer for me. Uh, once you get over your ego. Um, and so new teachers, new conductors, have people come and watch you. Have people come and come to your rehearsals. We have people visiting our rehearsals all the time for various reasons. Um, and I love it. I, I'm not, that doesn't bother me. That doesn't scare me. That doesn't rattle me. I'm gonna do my thing. <laughs> you know, I hope you like it. Um, but have people, you know, critique you. Open yourself up for critique. Um, go home and cry. And then the next day, you know, implement it and your life will be so much better. Man, uh, we're going to call this Andy's TED Talk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know about that, but. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, you just, you, you said so many things that are, that are so salient and salient points for me too. Um, and things that I try to pass on and things that I've turned the corner on, you know, over the last decade, decade or more. 
uh, in my journey too. you know, just leaving the, your ego at the door. We expect our singers to do that, mm -hmm. you know, when they come in the room, but too often we don't uh, as conductors. So to have somebody come in and critique you, um, just to be vulnerable enough to do that, you know, I, I applaud you and um, uh, fully endorse that. Um, I, I had my own um, mentors come in and, and do that here when I first got to this position. And I think it's so valuable and, and mm -hmm. such a great thing for you to highlight there. So thank you for that. And yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, what general advice, this kind of ties in, but what general advice would you give to yourself with all the knowledge and skills that you have now to your 16 year old self? Oh my gosh. Um, you, <laughs> I play piano pretty well, but I, I could play better. I wish I would have kept on it a little more. I, it's hard to lead. I can't imagine leading a rehearsal without those skills. And so keep practicing your instrument, like keep, keep playing piano and keep doing that. Um, I mean, really, I, I don't want to, I don't want this to be all lollipops and sunshine, but you have to build relationships. Like, um, 16 is a little young, but fast forward to 18, you know, like your first year of college, some of those friends are going to be with you for the rest of your life, you know? And so, especially if they're sort of on the same track as you. And so build those relationships early. Um, the other thing I would say, you know, I've been through a journey in my own life. Uh, and so, um, be unashamed about who you are and live into it and claim it. And, um, everything else will sort of fall into place until we're comfortable with ourselves. It took me a long time, Jeff, like there's, there's days I'm still not there. Um, but you know, I, I sort of, uh, my parents weren't, weren't terribly religious people. And, uh, but when I was real young, my mom was sort of connected to this Baptist church. And so I started going to the Baptist church and then I, I was a church bus kid. I went to church, um, every week on the church bus and, um, uh, sort of had Baptist roots, right. Because that's all, the only thing I knew. And so when I was old enough to get a church job to play my first Sunday, I was 16, I was playing at a church, it was a Baptist church. And it was hard to deal with, you know, sexuality and all the things that we're dealing with. And I, I look back and I gave up so much of my life trying to not be me and trying to be what everybody else thought I should be, what they said God wanted me to be. Um, There's 10 years of my life that was gone because I wasn't authentic to myself. Um, we can't make good music if we're not authentic. Right. And so I, I look back. And so the biggest thing I would tell myself is just, you know, love yourself. I um, surround yourself with people who get you, who support you, who love you. Cutting people out of your life is totally healthy. It sucks in the moment, but you got to get that sort of negativity out of there. But I, I, I'm, I'm happy with the way my life, my life turned out exactly the way it's supposed to turn out. I'm happy I'm married and all that stuff. But, you know, looking back, I wonder what life could have been like if I loved myself long before I actually sort of loved myself again this is getting way deep i feel like i'm in a, an online therapy session but <laughs> that's what i would tell my younger self just sort of love yourself quicker oh yeah. well, i love this getting deeper because you know it kind of gives an insight into who you are and that's the whole point of this but um uh the thing that that resonates with me is you know it's just now and i don't know how old you are but you know getting to the point where i am now i'm just i'm still trying to figure out on some days who i am yeah and you know, and uh, I've got mostly figured out now, but it, uh, everybody that's younger maybe can take that away is, you know, everybody kind of goes through this process of everybody. trying to figure out, of trying to figure out who you are. You're not, you're not yeah. alone in that. You know, yeah. everybody's going through these, these, uh, these same kind of uh, life journeys uh, of, right. you know, figuring out who, who you, who you really are. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I applaud you for that and that, that answer. So that's, uh, that's excellent advice. And I, you know, I don't know if there's a way to avoid it, to be honest. Um, yeah. You know, sometimes the only way to it is through it, you know? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you God. Know. Right. Right. Um, okay. So what advice do you think your elderly self would give to you right now? Um, who cares? Like, I mean, you know, like, <laughs> so, uh, I, 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 I love the Bible, but next to the Bible, I put, Tina Fey's book, Bossy Pants, and Amy Poehler's book, Yes, Please. I mean, there's so much scripture in those books. Like, I love it so much. And Amy Poehler talks about, like, who cares? Just, who cares? You're going to do this. You're going to, the things that we worry about, calm down. Like, 
the things that we think are important are just not important. And the things that we brush off in these, you know, I'm, I'm busy, right, Jeff? Like we're busy people. And when somebody comes through that door, I'm like, oh, you know, I've got stuff to do. That's my job. Like that's, that's my job. That's what's important. The email can wait. All this other stuff can wait. But that's like spend time with what's most important. And also just, you know, I, I think anyone who's gone through any kind of crisis, you know, my, my mother's, I, I told you my mother's uh, kind of sick right now. And um, that really puts things into perspective, man. When you're, when you're going through, you know, all that other little stuff just sort of goes away. And so I feel like my 90 year old self would look back and um, give me some of this advice. Also singers, I, I think I would look back and say, don't feel bad about like spending the five minutes talking about your story to your singers. The singers want to feel that connection with you. And we've, we're, we're so rigid with our, we don't want to waste rehearsal time or we don't want to do this, but it's all about connection. And we've talked about that seven times, but I, I think my older self would tell me spend more time in connection, take, go to the lunch, go to the meeting, you know, spend more time getting to know people, um, ask questions, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and also every every moment is a once in a lifetime opportunity uh i'm I'm, i'll be 10 years next year with the chorus and not one rehearsal has been the same the the just the biometric makeup right like there's different people different people different spaces every moment that we have especially as conductors is a once in a lifetime moment we'll never get that moment again in that same way um, especially with concerts, every, you know, we cycle out singers, you know, we have, we'll lose 10, we'll gain 15, we'll lose 15, we'll gain 10, you know, like every year we have this huge pool of people that join, we had 50 people join the chorus this year. Um, and so I think we have uh, an opportunity to continually introducing ourselves. Again, community choir is a little different, I think, because it is so cyclical. We lose people, we get people. And so every time there's 10 to 50 people who don't know me or know anything about me. And so I have to try to reintroduce myself. Um, and so I think my older self would say, take more time to for people to get to know you and for you to get to know other people. And who cares? You know, who cares? Yeah. Uh, you said who cares and my mind immediately went to Mel Robbins, let them, you know, yeah. um, uh, that whole mantra too. So a little bit different context, but uh, what you said there- I have a about- magnet in my office that says, you. Um, where is it? It's somewhere here. Is it on my drawer? I don't remember where. It's somewhere, but it says something about um, everybody doesn't have to like you. You don't like everyone. <laughs> I don't know where it is here, but you know that's yeah, that's yeah. I'm, I'm really resonating with all these quotes that that I'm seeing the meme quotes and stuff, and and yeah. one of them is, you know, everybody else's opinion about you is not your problem. You know, yeah, those, those sorts of things. So yeah, um, yeah, great advice. I think uh, I think a lot of people can get a lot out of that. Okay, so in in the zone when you're in the flow state. Uh, working on a passion project. What does that look like for you? Um, like physically, like just the, like the physical be, space? Yeah. Or... You, you can answer that. It can be physically. It can be, um, you know, your surroundings. It can be uh, mentally. It can be. Yeah. I need to be in my office. I have, I have like a really cool office and it's dark. You know, I just sort of have lamps and um, that's my creative space. I think. Um, I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I, I will plan to be in the zone and nine times out of 10, I won't get into the zone, but I'll be working on, you know, the all saints worship for next week. And then I'll find something and then I'll find something else. And then I'll do this. And then I'll find, and then I get in the zone accidentally, which I love. Like, and so I got to set everything aside for an hour while I'm, you know, sporadic zoneness, <laughs> you know, um, I feel like the more that I, I'll come in and I'll be like, okay, I got to I got to look at the orchestra scores for the Gloria today. Well, it might not be the day for the orchestra scores for Gloria. You know, you just the best laid plans, right? And so I I sort of feel like I know my I know my body, I know my brain capacity, I know my emotional state, and I have to be um I have to be in the right space to do that. Um, but I have to be I kind of have to be in my office. I feel like for some reason this is like my little sacred my little sacred space here. And I have yeah, to be prepared. Like I have to be, whatever I'm doing, I have to be ready for it. So like, you know, let's just use the rudder, for example. Um, I 
I'm not in a place really to do that because the choir is not there yet. Right. So like I need to, although I want to get that done, I, it's hard for me to move to the orchestral side of things when the choir, when we're still rehearsing it and I'm not really sure of tempos and that, does that make sense? So yeah. I, I can plan it. Um, but if I'm not there emotionally or, you know, with musically, then I, I'm going to have to wait until it's time, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So carving out a creative space and, and finding the zones can sometimes be elusive. Yeah. Um, sometimes you have to let it find you. So that's great. Yep. Uh, okay. So, and I apologize to all my guests about this question. It's just the juvenile nature of my brain, <laughs> but you know, I just uh, came up with this, you know, sanctioned WWE four person tag team of choral directors or clinic in session. Who are the three other choral directors that uh, you want in your corner to lay down the SmackDown? Yeah, that's not fair. Like I, I need, like, <laughs> I need an octagon so I can have more. Okay. Um, but I mean, get yourself a group text, right? Like, so like we have, my my four five best friends are on a group text and we text so much uh funny stuff weird stuff but also it's just the place to go to like they're my ride or dies like i don't know what i would do without any of them and um i you know, it's hard it, i hesitate naming anyone because um i don't want to leave anyone out but it's very if you know me it's very clear who my ride or dies are and so you know, Kevin McBeth and Dustin Cates at Temple and Brandon Williams at Rutgers and Curtis Heinrich, choral director here in St. Louis and uh, Pam Grooms. That's too extra, but I, I'm, I'm claiming, you know, I'm claiming that. But these are people that are just sort of my ride or dies for anything. And there are people that are like, no, don't do that. You don't. I mean, the amount of times that some of these friends are like, honey, don't you? No, we can't do that. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, know, yeah. I know you want to do the whole Rudder Gloria, but what? why don't you do the opening movement? And I'm like, no, we're going to do the whole thing. And now we're doing the opening movement, you know, <laughs> yeah. because they know and they, you know, they're lovingly, you know, they lovingly sort of share that with me, but get yourself some people. If you don't have people, find them, like go to conferences. That's where your people come from. I wouldn't know any of these people if it wasn't for conferences and we live five minutes from each other. I still wouldn't know them though, if it wasn't for MCDA and SWACTA and ACDA, you know, it, that's what you get at conferences. Also, for, for seasoned choral people, um, they, they sort of created a position for me at MCDA. I, I was an R&R &R person for 100 years. But I, so I, I do connections. So for, at, at Missouri, I plan the events and we do like live karaoke and the banquet, things like that. But I also, I reach out to every new person. Uh, last year, we had 51, I think, first time people at MCDA. And um, I reached out to every one of them. I was like, hey, what do you want to, what can I do for you? Meet me in the lobby. I hope to meet you. Like, what can I do? And I try to connect people. I'll see them and be like, Hey, do you know this person? And I actually spend time thinking about, okay, here's a new person from the KC Metro area who are two people that I can get them connected with. Um, but for our seasoned people out there, um, get out of your group for a minute. Like you got to get out of your, your click. You got to get out of your best friend group. Um, as uncomfortable as it is, or as much as you want to visit, get out of your group, go to the corner, talk to the person that no one's talking to. Go to the person who looks like they don't have anyone here at the conference, who's sitting by themselves at lunch. You will never know the huge impact you can have by just choosing where you sit at lunch. You can change someone's entire day. If they feel lonely or neglected or something, they're not going to learn that day, right? They're going to be distraught. And so for our seasoned folk, go find those people, find the people, connect with them, um, and maybe you might be part of their circle. Like, because people, as much as you want a circle, they're not just going to appear, right? Um, the other thing I would say is get involved. Like get involved at some level on at your state and uh, um, organization, because I think uh, having a circle is life-changing, absolutely life-changing. So I'm so thankful for my little circle of misfit toys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I love your your ride or dies, uh, you can have the octagon for sure. Yeah, um, yeah. I need it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, between, you know, in Missouri, between you and Kathy Bott, you know, I think, you know, <laughs> you guys and Jonathan and, you know, y'all, y'all, I think are doing, doing it right with the connection part, um, trying to put things together and, and people together. And what you said about the season folk uh, going and reaching out to those that are sitting alone, inviting them to lunch, that's so important, you know, we get so self-important and I just, I look at some folks at a conference sometimes and I go, you're just a choir director, you know, and I don't mean calm that. In a, yeah. Calm down. I don't mean that in a, in a real derogatory way, but I know, you know, just, just yeah. uh, 
be be human. Go talk to somebody, you know, and uh, you'll find it's our responsibility. Lot. It's not only yeah. what we're supposed to. I mean, it's our responsibility to do that. Well, that's yeah. that's that's part of the reason, in my opinion, anyway, why you know there's such division right now is that we're not talking to each other. Mm-hmm. Um, right. We we feel like we're better than than somebody else, and it's just not the case. You know, don't be so self important. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, getting on a soapbox there. Uh, <laughs> it's what we do. Right. Uh, what do you do to relax or fight burnout? Uh, I travel. I mean, whether it's popping to Kansas City to see friends or Chicago to see shows or um, visiting with family. Um, I love audiobooks. I love hearing stories from the author's mouth. You know what I'm recently into and I love it is Masterclass. I joined Masterclass. That has been amazing. Um, I've tried to replace doom scrolling with listening to a 15 minute something. And I'm intentionally trying to listen to people that I would never listen to, you know, um, ex presidents and things, you know, just things that I probably would never buy a book or something. I've learned so much. I've learned so much on leadership. I've learned so much on people's stories and context. Right. So like, uh, so masterclass is really kind of a good release for me. I've probably listened to 30 since I've had it in the last six months or so. Yeah, that's a great platform. I, I do the same, uh, or at least a similar thing with with uh, my podcast consumption. Mm-hmm. Um, trying to find you know people that I wouldn't normally listen to, uh, you know that I have to kind of force myself to it's listen hard. to. Hard, yeah, yeah. But you know that's what we all need, I think. Yeah, um, absolutely. Okay, so uh, I should have probably connected this question to the other one about you know having other choir directors in your corner, but who's another choral musician that you'd like to lift up right now that uh, maybe doesn't give it as much attention as you think they deserve? Oh, I mean, it's, it's the, let's call out the young teachers again that are just hustling, just hustling and that are loving the crap out of their kids. Like in this time that you just talked about, like they're sometimes they're it, right? Like sometimes the choir room is the room, the only room that they can be in. And there's just, in Missouri, you know, my context is Missouri and just right in this 10 minutes away, you know, I'm going to think of like Nadia Maddox and Jalen Vaughn Davis and these people that are in schools right here, right by my church um, that I think about and that I pray for and that I uh, think that they're doing incredible, incredible work. Um, And it's exhausting. Like it's absolutely, I see the exhaustion in their eyes. You know, some of them, some choral directors use our space and it's just a different world. You know, I come out and I'm like, hey, it's good to see you. And they're like, okay, where's your right? You know, like they're just, they're, they're yeah. at a, I mean, they walk in the door at a 12. Uh, and then I, I try to use this moment. It's a teachable moment. And I'm like, hey, what, how's, how's your wife? You know, how's your, how's your kids? Right. How, and I try to like get them to, you know, bring it down a little bit. But I just think these young teachers that have inherited bad programs or inherited no programs and they're just killing it. I mean, they're just kicking butt. And so those are the ones I want to lift up. Yeah, great choice. Yeah, I think we we all need to to do that. We lift up these young young folks. Yep. Uh, or even you know somebody who may be a little I'll use the word saltier like myself, um, <laughs> who who just uh, hasn't hasn't been into this is not true for me, but who who uh, is an emerging choral leader themselves coming to it later in life. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I've got this little cello round around. It's just uh, you know, quick fire questions, and yep. uh, if you, you shoot from the hip here, short answers. Can, uh, can I pass if I want? <laughs> you can pass. Yeah, absolutely. Pass or we can or we can circle back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so what's the worst job you ever had outside of choral music? Fazoli's real Italian, real fast. When I was sixteen. Okay. Yeah, I, I used to love <laughs> Fazoli's food, but yeah. I, I can understand from food. the food service point. Right. Yeah, exactly. Food. <laughs> right. Yeah, from the food service point, I've done that before myself, and. Right. and in restaurant work. So I get that. What's your guilty pleasure, bad food to eat? My what? Guilty pleasure, bad food. Crab Rangoon. All the Crab Rangoon on a plate. Uh, Crab Rangoon. Crab Rangoon. Okay. Uh, If you had to do any other job besides being a musician of some kind, what would that be? Uh, Nonprofit work. I serve on the board at uh, a nonprofit and I, I, some sort of nonprofit agency work development, that kind of thing. Okay. Love it. Uh, what's a movie or TV show you think everyone should watch at least once? West Wing. West Wing. That's a good one. Uh, I haven't heard that. Um, yeah, that's the that's the like the serious one. My favorite shows are like just my background is Parks and Rec, obviously. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thirty Rock, <laughs> Superstar. Um, 
I'm really into like how to, uh, the murders in the building, the, that one. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you were, you were mentioning Amy Poehler and Tina Fey. So I figured that that would, that would be 100%. Yeah. I've seen, okay. I've seen it so much and I listen to their books almost every night to fall asleep. But gotcha. what's the, uh, what's the, either what's the scariest moment in your life or what is your biggest phobia? I am terrified of clowns. Oh, like really? Hardcore clowns. Okay, so um, I know what to dress up as next time that I see you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know you think that you're kind of, but I will, uh, yeah, it, <laughs> terrified. Uh, what was the second part of that question? Terrified? Uh, it was just, a, it was a choice. It was either your, the scariest moment of your life or your biggest phobia. So I think you covered it. Let's let's just say clowns. I mean, there's been some okay. emotional stuff, but we don't have time to unpack that. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well, you know, you and I both. But yeah. uh, what's something you spend way too much money on? Travel. Travel. Okay. And art. Yeah. But that's how you also decompress. So it's money well spent. 100%. Yeah. Okay. Unapologetic. Yeah. There you go. Um, what is a secret talent that most people would be surprised to learn about you? I don't know. Yeah. I had nothing. You're, you're open for the world to see, huh? And I have a PhD in boom whackery. I don't know what, I don't. That's I don't, a good one. No, I don't okay. know. I, I don't really have a secret talent. I, oh, interior design. I love decorating. Okay. My and I own like a, a part-time staging business. And so we do that kind of stuff too. So I love like interior design and decorating and things like that. Okay. Boom whackers and interior design. Yeah, right. That <laughs> combo. That's great. Um, what is the oldest thing in your fridge? Oh, not very old. Okay. I, I'm obsessive. I'm, I, maybe ketchup. Uh, ketchup. I throw yeah, things out like crazy. Yeah. Yeah. We keep a bunch of those. Uh, I've never answered this question myself. I guess I should. Uh, packets. The little packets. Yeah. The little yeah. Uh, peel peel back packets. We have no dates on those packets. Get rid of them. You can't. Yeah, I know. I can't. I don't know why, why we have. Uh, no. Okay. I'm a germ. Um, <laughs> right. Right. Um, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Um, to not care about what people think about me <laughs> from an intellectual suit. You know, I'd, I'd be the dorky one in the corner. Everybody else would want superpowers and I just want like emotional superpower, but um, healing, right? Who wouldn't want to heal everybody? Who wouldn't want to take everybody's yeah. pain away? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No desire to fly. Emotional and physical. Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, okay. If you could have any message on a billboard for thousands of people to see, what would it say? Um... Be, you know be who you are like just just love who you are be be kind right like just mm -hmm. general tenets i'd probably have a bullet point of three things like love yourself love others give yourself a break who cares who cares who cares there you go who cares? i love it <laughs> that, i think that encompasses a whole lot of what you just yeah. said is, and i don't mean you shouldn't care I mean, you should. Uh, yeah, I, get, stuff, I, get, right? yeah, I get the like, context. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. Hopefully everybody else gets that context. You should care context. deeply. Yeah. Right. 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 Okay. Well, congratulations. You've achieved Tempo Press. So thanks for playing that game with me. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So what goals do you have in this uh, season or what are you most looking forward to in, in oh. this uh, upcoming time? Yeah. I mean, we're, you know, the season's kind of planned already, but for 25, 26, it's a huge year. It's, um, the course is 50th anniversary. And so we're doing a lot of exciting stuff. We're, we're commissioning a piece. We're um, doing our concert at Pal Symphony Hall. The new hall will be opened then. And so a lot to look forward to that season. It's also my 10th anniversary with the chorus. Um, the church, we're really excited. We're, we're in this multi-million dollar capital campaign that we're redoing our sanctuary, which will make worship so much better and um, all that. So there's a lot to look forward to in the next 16 months or so. So I'm really excited about those sort of two things. And that's Chorus great. America co conference is in St. Louis next year. So that's exciting. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, looking forward okay. to that. Great. Um, okay, so where can people go to learn more about you and your work? Um, I guess Facebook. You can. I'm I'm still an, an elder, so I'm on Facebook. Um, yeah. I literally have an Instagram account. I've never posted anything. I only joined so I could see other people's stuff. Really? Oh, you got to. Yeah, that's. I know. I, it's, I, I live more on Instagram than I do on Facebook these days. Yeah, I'm just I and I and I've been trying like so hard to like get away from that too, from the doom scrolling and things. But um, and then just you know email. I think I think my email is on the MCDA website, but it's just a Wagoner W A G G O N E R at Webster Hills UMC dot org. Okay, and uh, do you would you be opposed to us putting your uh, your choir's website on on the description no, of the all. video? No, it's um the community chorus is www.stl ccc.org 
that's our community choir. Cool. Yeah, and people can go there and kind of uh, see, see what's what going looks. on. Yeah, see what's going on. All right. Anything uh, that I didn't cover that you uh, you would like to offer up for the membership? No, I, I the only thing I'll say kind of in closing, Jeff, is that like whatever you're going through, somebody else has gone through and there might be a product for that. Uh, and I don't want to plug a certain one, but we just started last year using a choir management system. It's mm -hmm. changed our life. It's changed my life. It's changed the way the chorus does business. It changes the way the board does business. Um, and so we had a problem and we tried to find a solution. And, and so if you're going through something, there's a solution out there for it. Ask somebody, it might be a product, it might be just some advice, it might be somebody coming to work with your choirs, but um, don't feel the need to solve everything on your own. God knows that I only am here, number one, by the grace of God, but also just from people lifting me up and helping me in all those times. So just keep asking questions. Yeah, you don't have to know everything. Yeah. You know, so if uh, if there's something you're struggling with, you don't have the uh, you don't have to know how to do all the logistical things. Sometimes somebody's probably already figured that out. Don't don't blame them will. Yep. Yeah. Really cool. All right. Well, thanks for joining me, and uh, thanks for carving out some time. As I said, and um, and we will uh, hopefully get to see you real real soon at whatever next conference. Yeah, Dallas. Yeah, Dallas. Dallas, yeah. Dallas is coming up soon. Yep. Yeah. For sure. All right. Thanks so okay. much, Jeff. I appreciate it. Thanks.